keynote speaker, Professor Marilyn Ferrer, who's from the University of Technology in Sydney, um, specifically the Centre for Midwifery, Child and Family Health. She teaches undergrad and postgrad midwifery students and supervises students undertaking um, the honours, masters and PhDs. And she's published in over 100 journals, uh, book chapters, edited books, um, particularly uh, an amazing book called Birth Territory and Midwifery Guardianship. Marilyn's been a midwifery clinician, academic and researcher for three decades, working in Australia, New Zealand and in Denmark. Her PhD was one of the earliest randomised controlled trials of continuity of midwifery care conducted in Australia and now it's part of the Cochrane Systematic Review on Midwifery-led Models of Care, demonstrating conclusively that midwives and babies benefit if they have opportunities to get to know their midwife caregivers. And for the past five years, Marilyn's research has focused on the impact of the birth environment on the neurophysiology of labouring and birthing women and on their supporters and care providers. And this is the topic of this morning's presentation. So join me in welcoming Marilyn. Thank you, Marilyn. Thank you, Deb. And um, happy International Day of the Midwife to midwives everywhere. Can you hear me all right is the first question. Looks like it's yep, happening. We can. Good. Thank you. Um, I feel very privileged to be part of this amazing community um, who, of midwives who make a difference in the lives of millions of women and their families every day. I'm sitting here um, on the land of the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation. So you can see we're spread across Australia uh, far and wide as well as, as well as the rest of the world. I'm very pleased to be part of the virtual conference, conference to, to share some of the ideas we've been exploring for the past five years around how the space in which women give birth and where midwives work might influence what happens um, and in particular to explore the prevailing emotion of fear that um, many of us feel about birth. Uh, and uh, I want to explore a little bit about where does that feeling come from? How does the space that we are, are working in make a difference to that feeling? And what can we do about it using the concept of design? Now, I've got multiple things happening here in front of me and I'm <laughs> trying to um, get the technology to work properly. So forgive me if I'm fumbling about here a bit to do that. OK, so what we're going to do is fundamentally explore three questions. First of all, I want you to consider the spaces in which you work, be that at home or in birth centres or in hospitals. And here are the questions. Is the space in which you work a sanctuary or what we might call a surveillance space? And just what does that mean? Does the space in which you work, here we go, <laughs> um, create feelings of trust and safety? or feelings of insecurity, mistrust and fear in you and in the women for whom you care? And finally, just what do we mean by that and what can we do about designing out this concept, this idea, this feeling of fear? One of the um, uh, people who's had something to say about design was Steve Jobs, who's the, the co-founder of the Apple company. He said this, in most people's vocabularies, design means the veneer, it's interior decorating, it's just the fabric of the curtains or the sofa. In fact, nothing could be further from the meaning of design. Design is not just what something looks like and feels like, although they are critical. The most important thing is that design is how it works. We're going to come back to that um, again. First of all, I want to take you on a small journey of the imagination. I want you to imagine for a moment. You're a brand new midwife. It's your first day at your job in a new hospital. You've never been in it before. Or you're a woman having her first baby, excited about the prospect of becoming a mother and holding your baby in your arms very soon. You've been allocated a room, so you open the door and you walk in. I want you to focus on 
the thoughts that might be appearing in your mind. Focus on how this space is making you feel. What might be happening as you move around the room and look at what's in there. Now the spaces in which you work, of course, might be very differently set up with more or less of what that room contains. It might look like any of these rooms. What messages or images do these rooms bring to mind? What's common to them all? Many years ago, um, a group of us put together what we called um, the safe, satisfying birth hypothetical model to see if we could pull together what was understood at that time about um, the, the elements that made up uh, an environment, a space in which a woman could experience a safe and satisfying birth. A lot of it was based on the work of um, an architect uh, that we'd met many years before called Bianca Lapori. And in order to design spaces that she felt would best meet the needs of women in labour, she followed women at home to see what it was like in environments where women weren't constrained by what was uh, around them, but in their own environment. And what she discovered was that at home women seldom give birth in the bedroom, but more often in their sitting room, where they select an empty and protected area never exposing themselves at the centre of the scene. The birth room to house women in hospitals is clearly a bedroom and it's not the cosy private nest that women create at home, but a stage on which the woman becomes a spectacle under constant surveillance and control. So the place of birth matters. And here's a list of the kinds of places where birth occurs, at home, freestanding birth centres, alongside birth centres, and in hospitals, either tertiary, secondary or indeed primary hospitals. And the UK Place of Birth Study, which was published uh, in 2011 in the British Medical Journal, looked at maternal and perinatal outcomes by planned place of birth for healthy women with low risk pregnancies. It's called the Birthplace in England. It's a national prospective cohort study. And they produced uh, reams and reams of wonderful uh, data revealing that uh, where the women birthed made a difference to the kinds of outcomes they had and the kinds of interventions they experienced during labour and birth. I'm not going to show you the reams of tables. What I want to show you is the way a journalist uh, from the BBC reconstructed some of that material to show you very clearly why he came up with the conclusion that home birth might be the best option for many babies. What James Gallagher did was to extract the data from those tables to reproduce this table divided by home freestanding midriff unit, alongside unit and obstetric unit to demonstrate what was the experience of mothers and babies. These data are rates per 1,000 babies or 1,000 mothers going into labour. So for similarly risk women, serious medical problems in their babies occurred at the same rate from home to hospital with a slightly lower rate in alongside midwifery units. But normal vaginal birth occurred more per thousand births at home, of course, than it did in the obstetric unit. Physiotomy was less at home compared to the obstetric unit. Caesarean birth was far less for women who started their labour at home compared to those in the obstetric unit. And instrumental births had a similar pattern. So clearly, intervention rates alter depending on how complex the unit is and home is where you experience the least amount of intervention or the same uh, rate of wellness in babies. So I think his conclusion looked pretty reasonable on the basis of that data. So place of birth matters. Just why? What is it about those different places of birth that might be making a difference to the outcomes? So let's explore 
just a couple of those places. Home, a birth centre and a hospital. And this woman is experiencing birth at home. And every home is entirely different in terms of its physical layout and construction, the aesthetics, the temperature, the smells, the sounds, the light, the colours, the people who are with you, your culture, and of course, the element of fear. At home, during the course of labour, women can move freely from one space to another, moving from laying down on a bed if they want, with other people if they want, they can be making food in a very domestic part, being part of the domestic and intimate daily life, or they can retreat into, into themselves through immersion in a bath or pool in order to focus inwardly. There are many ways at home that the woman can be in that space. This is a birth centre. The this is one of the women who took part in our a particular piece of research where we followed women during labour and birth in various locations. It's the middle of the night, so the photographs are quite dark because there's soft, subdued lighting. There are mats on the floor where the woman's mother has made her a nest to rest in. Her sister is sitting by her on the couch, asleep almost because it's the middle of the night. At one stage, the mother got up off the floor and said she needed to lean against the wall. And the mattress happened to be leaning against the wall itself, so she leant against it. And I was interested to find that this is clearly a, a, a movement that other women make during labour, because on the Royal College of Midwives Normal Birth Campaign website, there are illustrations to suggest the kinds of movements, activities that might be possible for women. And I found they similarly had drawn a picture of a woman standing and leaning against the wall. For this woman in the birth centre, who ultimately had a straightforward normal birth, there was no sense of fear. She laboured for 15 hours. She resisted any suggestions of interventions to speed up her labour or to, or to receive analgesia. So in the birth centre, she achieved the same kind of outcome as the woman at the home birth. These are another three women from our research very generous people who agreed to have us in there filming them during the labour so they could we could see how they interacted with the, with the space and with the people they shared the space with. They all experienced a vaginal birth with healthy babies. And how different or how similar are their birth spaces to each other? And how are these spaces different from those of the birth centre or home? Think about how does the hospital space enable the woman to be herself? to move as she wishes and to do what she wants. And what is the pervasive sense uh, of safety, security or fear in this kind of a space? What's common and how do they differ? And I've made a list of some of the commonalities and the differences in all of these spaces. They certainly look and smell different and in their level of familiarity and homeliness. They may differ on which women can access which locations, what models of care are on offer, what are the levels of surveillance or sanctuary, and we're going to explain that a little more. They differ on how autonomous are the clinicians who work with them, what access is there to drugs or interventions or more complex levels of care. They differ on what are the cultures of care, who has the power in that place. And then there are unknown unknowns that we don't even know about yet that they may differ on. So basically, how do we make sense of this? And here we go. How can we make sense of this? The place of birth is quite complex and all of these characteristics may interact in known and unknown ways. So there are three questions that we need to consider. What is it about the place of birth that makes it different? If we can find out what it is, can we design more of it? And is it simply the physical nature of it? Remember, Steve Jobs said, it's not just what it looks like and feels like, but there's something about how it works that is the key element. How it works is clearly um, influenced by what it looks like and feels like and what this, in, what this implies, what you are meant to do in this room. And in hospitals, we mostly work in rooms that are to a larger or a lesser extent versions of this kind of a space. 
it's probably fairly easy to see uh, that this kind of space might make possible different feelings and therefore different kinds of birth outcomes. It's a beautiful new birth centre in Toronto in Canada. But very few of us will ever have the possibility to rebuild our hospitals to look like this. So let's explore some theoretical ideas that might provide some principles we could use in our existing units to design what we have to work differently. Kathleen Fay developed this idea of places for birth as either surveillance rooms or sanctuaries. And I'm sure you don't need me to tell you which kinds of rooms might be preferred by women and why. But the ideas of surveillance and sanctuary are also multifaceted and complex ideas and it's not as clearly differentiated as you might imagine. For instance, is this woman also experiencing surveillance or sanctuary? I, I met a wonderful person called Marie Stenglin many years ago and Marie is a, a, a linguist, a social linguist and she worked in the area of semiotics or what are the meanings of objects and spaces and Marie produced this concept of binding that I think helps us understand even more about what we mean by a surveillance space or a sanctuary where women might feel um, safe and secure or unsafe and afraid. The concept of binding talks about the way spaces close in on us or open up around us. Spaces that close in around us in a particular way feel comfortable, make us feel secure and are the basis of what is a sanctum. Spaces that are too closed, too tight around us or, who, or which are much too open with too little enclosure actually make us feel quite insecure and these are the characteristics of surveillance spaces. Let's have a look a little more. What Marie's theory suggests to us is the reason why many women want to gravitate towards a birth pool or bath during labour. If you think about it in terms Okay, we're just taking a minute to try and fix the uh, the problem here. We won't be a moment. Ah, yep, my microphone's back on again now. Can you hear me, Deb? Yeah, we all seem to um, lose sound then, so uh, we'll just get your screen back to where you're up to and carry on, Marilyn, Thanks, we'll give you a minute. I'm just taking a minute to um, get the PowerPoint back up to where it was. Um, you might be able to take okay, this opportunity to stand up and stretch. Almost there.
Okay, while we're uh, working on getting the presentation back, um, okay, it might take a minute. We're, we're just having to search for the, the slides. Um, Perhaps we could okay. take some questions. Oh, yeah, that's a great idea, Lorraine. I see um, in the comments, Marilyn, people were really enamoured with the idea of the sanctuary or, or surveillance and I see that you're just starting to unpack that um, now which is uh, fascinating. Yeah, I mean certainly thinking about women uh, in Australian hospitals in particular all want to be able to have access to water immersion during labour and indeed often end up giving birth in the bath um, to the point where in New South Wales, the state that I'm located in, the government has made a mandate that every birth unit um, must provide women with the opportunity for water immersion during labour, which is pretty unusual. Um, and Marie Stenglin's concepts of, of binding kind of give us an understanding of why that might be. Oh, let me have That's a look. great. You should be at yes, move those on now. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. There we are. So we're back to why a woman might want to uh, get into a bath or indeed stand under a shower. And basically when we, and we have, uh, with Robin Maud in New Zealand, I interviewed numbers of women about why they got into the bath during labour. And basically what they said was, well, it's a place where no one else can touch me. It's a private space. It's an enclosed space where I feel much more secure uh, and safe. So this idea of binding uh, gives us an idea why women might want to uh, get into the bath or indeed stand under a shower because they know that other people aren't going to get under there with them and get wet. And they're certainly not going to get in the bath with them, or, although obviously partners sometimes do at a woman's invitation. So um, using this idea of bonding suggests, or, uh, suggests why this might be important for women. <clears throat> I want you to look at this space and think about in terms of the boundness or unboundness of this space. It's a newly renovated birth unit. Um, previously the unit that they were in had no outside windows and the spaces were uh, quite enclosed and cave-like. How would women feel in this space and where does it fit on the, the bound or unbound spectrum? And I think you'll agree with me, it's beautiful from an architectural point of view. Wouldn't you love to be sitting there having your lunch looking out at that wonderful view? But for a woman in labour, this space is experienced as incredibly unbound and an unbound space feels unsafe. So what's happening in practice is the blinds are kept closed the entire time and the woman is not gazing out at the view because she feels exposed and vulnerable and under surveillance in this kind of a space. What about two bound spaces? Again, in interviewing women, and women for instance who are connected to a CTG machine, and many of them for the entire length of their labour, and most of our units can't afford to have telemetry monitoring, so the woman is strapped to the machine and therefore marooned on her bed or in a chair, unable to move. And she certainly feels trapped and potentially too bound. And this idea of not being able to move freely evokes feelings of insecurity and fear and apprehension. So again, thinking about how do we design out fear in our spaces? How many women are we keeping attached to CTG monitors? Um, so Marie's theory about binding um, came up with the kind of idea that makes a sanctum is one that is optimally bound and optimally unbound. Because again, there are times during labour where there's an ebb and flow, where the woman wants to interact differently with people, where she wants to move or be or lay or stand or sit or talk. And so we have to be able to think about how to design spaces that can accommodate this ebb and flow. One of the places that I'm um, uh, aware of is, in fact, in Denmark. And in this space, the designers have thought very carefully about how do you accommodate the ebb and flow of labour, or they may have done it accidentally, but this is what's happened. 
This unit is certainly not at a beach. What you're looking at is a projection of a beach on the walls, plain white walls of this birth unit. And it's done by a very simple piece of equipment that's located on the ceiling. It's a little um, uh, projector. And uh, on the table you can see a small little computer screen or iPad screen. And the woman and the family in the space can actually dial up what kind of an environment they would like to be in. An open, unbound space like this one, or at a different time in her labour, she might want to feel that she's in a more bound, enclosing uh, and secure kind of space. And in fact, I can imagine you, can, you could put in all sorts of images that might be even more personal for the woman in the room that would make her feel secure and bound. Or at times when she wanted to be open and engaged with other people, you could have an image uh, of a much more open vista. This equipment is not expensive. I've been in my local Apple shop and I can purchase the projector to do this for around $200. So at least in the developed world where we are relatively affluent, we could all afford to do this kind of thing in our birth units. The challenge is, of course, we need to have walls which are plain uh, and unobstructed by other sorts of equipment and paraphernalia in the space. So let's have a look more carefully at what's happening at a neurophysiological level. The, the limbic system, there, that little yellow kind of horseshoe shape in the middle of the brain on the right, is hardwired to translate emotions to keep us safe. And surveillance activates the very core of this limbic system, the amygdala. It stimulates the release of all sorts of neurohormones that have to do with flight, fight and freeze, but in particular adrenaline. Uh, and those of you who know me know I bang on about this stuff all the time, but we need to know what's going on neurophysiologically with women in labour, not just with their uterus. Because if a woman is afraid, fearful, stressed, feels like she's under constant surveillance and her amygdala activates this process, she will produce adrenaline in particular, but also noradrenaline, which has a slightly different effect. Let's focus on adrenaline. adrenaline when it increases, it disrupts the production of oxytocin and it interferes with the rhythmic contractions of the uterus, either making them irregular or making them slow down to the point where uterine inertia is diagnosed. On the other hand, increases in adrenaline divert blood away from um, the uh, trunk of the body into the muscles of the arms and the legs for fast running away or fighting and into the brain for thinking about how to uh, get out of this fearful situation. So in fact it constricts the blood vessels to the abdomen, decreases uterine blood flow which then decreases placental perfusion and fetal oxygenation leading to fetal distress. So whilst we haven't done experiments on women to actually see that this happens, there have been experiments done on animals and it can dem we can demonstrate in labouring um, primates in particular, you can induce uh, both uterine inertia and fetal distress by making the animal feel afraid. So what can we do if we can't change that space, as many of us can't? We can actually use the human body to simulate that experience because the very first sense of shelter we might have is that of being in your mother's arms. So that we can make spaces that are comforting or protective in that same way by being in someone's arms. And again, the Royal College of Midwives Normal Birth Campaign website has wonderful cartoon illustrations which show exactly how you can make bound spaces for women in places where you can't modify the environment. And here are just some of them. These enveloping arms help the woman to feel that she's in a bound, secure, safe space. And you can do it in all sorts of ways, with the woman sitting on the birth ball, with the woman squatting in between her partner's knees. She can get into the bathtub. And it doesn't have to be a deep immersion pool, although that's ideal, but in this, even in this kind of a little space, the woman is not going to be um, having anybody else getting in there with her. So she may get that sense of security um, and a private space. 
for these kinds of, of uh, places, even using inanimate objects like the chair, which the women, woman can envelop, also gives her a sense of being bound and more secure. So um, there's much more that we can talk about, but we don't have time today. These are just a, a small snippet of the kind of ideas that we've been exploring about how do you optimise birth physiology. Basically, we need an optimal birth environment that might be optimally bound for women, but we also need relationship-based care because the two together help initiate the amazing neurophysiological calm and connect system that ensures that the woman has optimal oxytocin to help her labour progress. It lowers her blood pressure, her heart rate, increases her pain threshold, and normal birth is more likely. If a woman has straightforward normal birth, then she is more, her baby is more likely to have its own neurophysiological system initiated in an optimal way. There are many, many studies that I could talk about. We've also looked at the impact of these kinds of places on midwives themselves. Um, and um, Athena Hammond is one person who's produced several papers in this area. And this paper is, is also from Deb Davis and Caroline Homer recently looking at how does place of birth impact on midwives? What Athena has concluded is that the current design of many hospital birth rooms challenges the provision of effective midwifery practice and changes to the design and the aesthetics of birth rooms may engender safer, more comfortable and more effective midwifery practice. Because if midwives are working in environments where their brain is affected, it shuts down their prefrontal cortex and makes their amygdala fire up so that they are fearful and in the fight, flight or freeze moment. I think we might call it a day there. That's the end of my presentation. Thank you. And I'm very happy to receive questions. What a, a lovely, joyous family photo to finish on there, Marilyn. Thank you so much. Um, we'll open the floor to questions. So if you can raise your hand if you want to ask a question and we can give you the mic. Alternatively, you can type it in um, in the chat box. Um, we did have one question um, just while people are, are getting ready to put their hands up, Marilyn, from somebody in the chat box. I think it was Ray from Western Australia. Um, and it might have been the Danish birth room and he wanted to know the name of the Equipment. He might have been um, referring to the the yeah, projection equipment. Um, um, yeah, yeah I can't. Or the room itself. The projection equipment. I think if you just go into any uh, uh, one of these techno shops, it's 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 a, a projector that can project. It has a little uh, projection uh, apparatus that has four outlets, so it'll do. Uh, 360 degree projection. They're very simple pieces of machinery. I don't know exactly what their name of them, Rita. Um. Thank you. And I think the um, the images that were projected were specifically made for that purpose from memory. Yes. Is that right? Yeah. I, yeah. I think they are scenes of a forest in Denmark, <laughs> scenes of a beach somewhere in Denmark, and they have yeah. other so uh, amazing scenes of video yeah. that were going so and they also had the sound of the lapping water and yes. the rustle of the leaves in the forest. I mean were, uh, um, I think the the one that they particularly have was purchased from the Phillips company and it cost many 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 thousands of dollars but I discovered it is possible to set it up uh, in a much less sophisticated way and a much less expensive way. Thank you. I'm just scrolling down. Does anybody want to take the mic and ask a question or make a comment? Oh, I can see Eva Wilding made a question. What study was it that showed the security of home birth? There is a paper by um, Bianca Lapori um, and um, it's called, uh, hmm, just trying to think of it now. It's in a journal called uh, about children's um, spaces, I've lost, I've lost it now, Deb. I can't think of what it's called. Yeah. But you'll find it uh, referred to in our paper on safe, satisfying birth. So uh, have a look there, and you'll find the paper.
Oh yes, yeah, so someone's also mentioned um, uh, making an analogy with newborns and how they um, need that close nesting kind of a, approach rather than something unbounded. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you certainly wouldn't leave a newborn laying out <laughs> in, the, in the open and watch what it was doing. You want to cuddle them close and um, help them feel secure in that bound way. So a absolutely, the same sense. I think uh, what I really appreciated, Marilyn, was that you um, you drew on some great new theoretical insights. I love the idea of the bounded and the unbounded, but you um, uh, brought it down to a level of practice. So there's great practice tips, really, for people how they can kind of understand this theory and what they can do um, in any sort of environment because um, not everybody can have a home birth and many women are birthing in um, hospitals which uh, our environments that we can't change immediately, but you gave us some great ideas for what we can do yeah. just to help women feel more secure in, in the worst of environments, really. Yeah. And one of the challenges is that in Australia, I know for sure, and it happens in most developed countries, that many, many millions of dollars are being spent every year on renovating or rebuilding birth units. And unless midwives get to talk to architects and designers who are part of the teams putting these together, then they will build um, or renovate birth units like the illustration I showed you of the one with the blue couch and the blue bed and all the beautiful windows in it. It looks great if its purpose is other than for women during labour and birth. You have to help them understand what it is that women during labour and birth need uh, in order to make the room work. So design is about how it works, not just what it looks like or feels like. In Australia, there are several units that are using these design principles and have used them to establish their birth units. Deb, you work in some in Canberra. I do. Um, yes, we've got a beautiful uh, birth centre in Canberra and um, um, that is really a sanctuary, I think. But I, I was going to comment as well when people are asking about the redevelopment and involving other people that it's really hard work to get the midwifery perspective and some of this theory and understanding through, isn't it, to architects and the powers that be when a new um, hospital or a new unit's being developed. I don't know if you yeah. want to comment on that. I've had that, a lot of experience well, with that. Yeah, it, it is challenging and certainly um, all of these possibilities are filtered through budgets ultimately. But if we can get some principles in the mind of the people who are designing them, then they will interpret them in various ways. But if the principles are strong, then hopefully that you know these ideas of binding um, will will uh, be uh, embraced within the principles. Next week, I'm about to start work with in New South Wales, the uh, part of the health department that writes the health facility guidelines for how you build. Uh, amongst other things, birth units in hospitals. Uh, and we have been consulted in uh, years past and parts of our work is included in them, but now there's a whole redevelopment of these facility guidelines about to happen. And these facility guidelines influence what happens in the building of all maternity facilities in Australia. Uh, and um, in New Zealand as well, depending on which companies get to build them. Um, and often they're um, Australian related uh, companies that are building all, all over the um, Australasia uh, region. I also work with a, a private uh, architecture firm uh, on their health facility guidelines and they build facilities throughout Southeast Asia, parts of America and India. Um, and their health facility guidelines pretty much match what uh, is done in the New South Wales health Guidelines. So that's one way of trying to influence um, what happens. Uh, hopefully we've put in an abstract at ICM for actually running a workshop for midwives in what do you need to know to sit at the table uh, in order to influence the design of the birth unit in your place. So hopefully we might our abstract might get accepted and we can run a workshop. Thank you. Um, Tracy Ray the issue of smells, which I think is really important, and the role of oh, essential yeah. oils. Yeah. Yep. Um, 
absolutely critical. I mean, um, the, your olfactory nerves are connected directly and deeply into the brain and, and smells trigger memories. And if you've had an experience, a healthcare experience with the smells you're likely to encounter in a hospital with disinfectants and cleaning agents and things that might be associated with painful procedures, you don't, you're not even aware of it, but that's what will be triggered uh, in your brain when you walk into a birth room. And I spoke just yesterday to a group of new midwives, new student midwives, first year about to start their clinical placements. And they've walked into these units and they say, wow, it smells like disinfectant and kind of the metallic smell of blood is in the air. And <laughs> it's terrifying for them. So yep, aromatherapy is a critical part of, of uh, setting the environment. Thank you. And maybe just the, the last point, a good one to finish on was Anna was asking how she can follow your work, Marilyn. Um, certainly through our publications, Anna, uh, and if you just uh, Google my name, I'm somewhere in some people's place, uh, papers. <laughs> but we're hopefully going to be able to write a new book that pulls all of this together um, because uh, it's a critical topic. We have to get it right. We can't be wasting money on rebuilding units that, that aren't fit for purpose. And the purpose is helping women to have a straightforward normal birth and we keep building units that look like modified operating theatres with material all around them that women are very well aware is going to be used on them uh, and in them. And so it's quite a frightening prospect. So hopefully uh, in the future a book, um, but certainly in our publications currently. Thank you, Marilyn. Okay, I'll, I'll bring it to a close right on time. <laughs> um, I want to thank you, Marilyn, for years and years of dedicated work and the most fascinating work, particularly in this area. It's just given midwifery and so much. So thank you for that and thank you for sharing it so generously as um, you very often do um, with this audience and more. So uh, join me, everybody, in thanking Marilyn. You can do a virtual, there's a virtual clap happening virtual. there, <laughs> Thank you. Uh, thank you, everybody, and happy, happy International Midwives Day. You too. You too. Thank you. Okay, everybody, just uh, bear with us now. We'll be doing a changeover. Uh, we have about 10 minutes to get ourselves set up, so it's time to um, stretch your legs. Somebody's just delivered me a coffee into my office, which I'm very appreciative.